Hello, and welcome to Being Well. I'm Rick Hansen, a psychologist and author who studies how we can change our brains and our minds for the better. Today, we're going to continue a discussion we started last week when I was talking about the three fundamental ways to practice skillfully, to engage your mind skillfully, letting be, letting go, and letting in. Today, we're going to focus on the how-to of the last one, cultivating good things inside yourself. And we'll be answering the question of what you can actually do right in the flow of your everyday life to grow the good stuff, inner strengths of various kinds inside yourself, especially in the face of the brain's evolved negativity bias, which makes it more like Velcro for the bad and Teflon for the good. So we're going to tilt that bias in your own direction, making your brain more like Velcro for the good and Teflon for the bad. We do this by using a method I call taking in the good, or more formally, mindful cultivation. Taking in the good has four fundamental steps that I remember with the acronym HEAL, H-E-A-L, which stands for have, enrich, absorb, and link. And that will be the focus of today's episode. Okay, here we go. Two weeks ago, the first in this series, uh, I talked about how you can use your mind to change your brain. Pretty basic, pretty great. Second talk last week was about the three ways to engage the mind, three ways to practice. We can first be with what's there without trying to influence it, or second, we can reduce what's negative, or third, we can increase what's positive. If the mind could be likened to a garden, we can witness the garden, we can pull the weeds, and we can plant flowers. All three are important. Uh, My focus in this series of presentations is on the third of these, the planting flowers aspect of practice, uh, and it's important for me to put it in context. Okay. Now, today, I'd really like to talk about the how-to. How do you actually grow good stuff inside yourself? How do you get those flowers to take root in the garden of the mind when, as we've talked about before, the brain has a negativity bias? Using the metaphor of the garden still, that soil is very fertile for weeds because Mother Nature needed our ancestors to learn quickly and well and hold on to the learning from painful, frightening, threatening, Uh, frustrating, uh, loneliness-inducing experiences. Because if our ancestors ever survived those experiences, they needed to learn from them deeply so they could avoid them in the future, because they may not get it. They They might not have gotten a second chance to survive. That's the negativity bias of the brain, which, on the other hand, makes the brain very inefficient at internalizing positive experiences and turning them into happiness inside, or feeling loved inside, or feeling loving inside, or wisdom, or mindfulness, or virtue inside. The brain is very inefficient at turning positive experiences into these inner resources, inner strengths, even though the basis of the inner strengths, like happiness, or lovingness, or resilience, determination, or virtue, um, the basis of those inner strengths is primarily positive experiences. In effect, there's a kind of bottleneck in the brain that makes it hard to get those inner, to get those positive experiences to become inner strengths. What are we going to do about this? Well, that's where we have the opportunity to use the power of the mind to change the brain, to pop open that bottleneck, to pop open the bottleneck and let positive experiences commit to ourselves in such a way that they gradually change brain structure. So I'd like to talk about how to do it, first of all, and then talk about two kinds of applications, one of, both of which are fundamental to life, uh, including to Buddhist practice. So, how do you turn a positive experience into lasting brain structure? Because we have the opportunity to do that in the most important minute of our life which is the next one, minute after minute after minute after minute, right? We can't do anything about the past. Much more than a minute into the future, our influence starts to fade rapidly. But we have pretty good influence over the next minute 
in terms of what the of the range of possibility. What will we do with the most important minute of our life? The next one, minute after minute after minute, all the minutes of our lives. As I say in Tibet, if you take care of the minutes, the years will take care of themselves. The way the brain forms structure, as you may have heard me say, is not the way you install songs in an iPod. Right? If we want to get songs in an iPod, we just kind of hook it up to our computer or log on our internet, Wi-Fi or whatever, and we just kind of transfer them over. Zip, they're there. The way you get songs into the brain, the way the brain records the good music we all want to get inside ourselves, is you've got to play it. It's like an old school cassette recorder or a modern day DVR. You record it by playing it. We have to have the experience and sustain the experience for it to sink into our brain. So there's three basic steps with an optional bonus step if you want. The first step is to have the positive experience in the first place, either because you notice you're already having it or because you create it. So let's use an example of uh, kindness for others. That's a common example in Buddhist practice as well as other traditions around the world and secular humanism and all the rest and good old common sense. You know, as a, the rules in kindergarten, I love those rules that are often posted. Uh, pay attention, be nice, share your toys, right? Like, are those rules to live by or not or what? So uh, the experience of kindness, caring for others. So we might notice we're already feeling caring or kind or supportive or friendly or affectionate or even loving or, let's say, appreciating towards somebody. Or we might deliberately not just notice it, we might deliberately create that positive experience to have it in the first place. We might call to mind someone and think to ourselves, may you be safe, may you be happy, may you be healthy. May you live with ease. We might deliberately create a positive experience. Okay? So now we've activated it. Okay? It's a little bit like a fire. The first step of taking in the good is to light the fire. We have to have the positive experience in the first place. In the second step, we begin to install this activated experience into brain structure. We add fuel to the fire by helping the experience last and as well, if it's appropriate, one or more of four additional ways to turn experiences into brain structure. Intensity, that's the second way besides duration. Intensity, we help it become intense. We, we grow the feeling of being loving. We give ourselves over to it. We let it pervade the mind. Third, multimodality. We try to feel it as an emotion in our body. We might even enact it by reaching out our hand as if we were reaching out our hand in a loving way or letting a a facial expression of kindness, caring, come into our face, right? Multimodality. The fourth way to enrich an experience, enrich being the second step of taking the good, is to see the novelty in things to see what's fresh about these positive experiences instead of being jaded about them. Um, was sometimes called beginner's mind, Zen mind, don't know mind, right? Where we can look at the world through the eyes of a child and take a familiar experience of gratitude or determination or lovingness and see what's fresh about it. And then last, the fifth factor, well established in oodles of studies in psychology, that increases learning, including emotional learning that we're talking about here, is personal relevance. Seeing for ourselves why it would be relevant to me to cultivate, let's say, loving kindness for others, in my example here. Okay? So, so far I'm in the second step of taking in the good. The first step, have the positive experience, activate it. And then in the second step, begin to install it through enriching it. Third step, which overlaps the second, and you can use this yourself every day, a few times a day, to help the good stuff sink into you. The third step, A for absorb. We um, prime memory systems by intending and sensing that the experience is going into us. 
All right. So, for example, we might uh, imagine or sense that the feeling of lovingness or kindness or compassion is sinking into us like water into a sponge. With children, I'll talk about putting a jewel in the treasure chest of the heart. You might have a sense of warmth going into you, like uh, the warmth of a cup of hot cocoa into your hands on a cold winter's day. Or maybe there's just a knowing that somehow this experience is sinking in. There's an intending to give oneself over to it, to let oneself be changed just a little bit by this experience. There's a traditional saying, the mind takes its shape from what it rests upon. Resting our mind upon a positive experience, such as feeling loving or kind, we're allowing our mind's shape to shift just a little bit, to be willing to budge, to become a little different, to have the courage, in some sense, to die a little bit to the old self, to grow a little bit into a new one. Right? That's essentially the third step of taking the good. That process, which I've kind of unpacked, you know, can sound complicated. In ordinary life, it usually takes 10 or 20 seconds. If you were to summarize the whole practice in four words, it would be, have it, enjoy it. That's it. Enjoy it. We're very good at having positive experiences, both informally in our hedonistic culture and more formally through uh, practices uh, in human resource trainings in corporations, in psychotherapy, in character education for children, or in just everyday efforts to try to enjoy life. We're pretty good at having positive experiences, but I think we're really lousy at installing them. We're really lousy at helping them sink into us. Consequently, most positive experiences are wasted on the brain. Even though they're the primary source of positive mood, resilience, and other inner strengths that we all want. So those are the three basic steps, H-E-A. The fourth step, the bonus one, is LINK, L for LINK. So it gives you an acronym that's easy to remember, HEAL, H-E-A-L. Have, enrich, absorb, LINK. LINK simply means that while experiencing a positive experience in the foreground of awareness, also being aware of something negative. So that, because neurons that fire together wire together, the positive material starts going into, weaving its way into the negative material, gradually soothing it and eventually potentially replacing it. In effect, flowers start crowding out weeds and actually eventually flowers can uh, replace weeds in the garden of the mind. That's the essence of taking in the good. I did not invent this practice. What I've tried to do, though, is really understand its steps and uh, help people become very, very skillful at it. Okay, great. So you got the basic idea. We all know how to take in the good. We've all had experiences of letting a nice moment land. And I'm really talking about um, using this practice from the standpoint of a very clear-eyed understanding about the negativity bias of the brain, and also a recognition that to deal with life, let alone to do spiritual practice, we need to build up good stuff inside ourselves. For me, taking the good is not about positive thinking, which is usually wasted on the brain, because those thoughts don't become experiences that sink into neural structure. Nor is it about looking on the bright side. Actually, paradoxically, the more we, we look on, the more, we, the more that we see the good facts, and we allow ourselves to have legitimate, typically earned, good experiences, the more that we do that and build up resources inside, the more capable we become of seeing and dealing with the hard things in life. It's a very important frame here for me. So we can use these methods in two kinds of ways. The first way I'll call sort of the ordinary way. The ordinary way includes developing a greater sense of gratitude and well-being and optimism and everyday effectiveness. And also, we can use the ordinary way to take in the good to heal old pain. We can deliberately look for those key experiences that are the antidotes to what ails us. They're the medicine for what ails us. And to use a framework um, that I have found very helpful, 
grounded in the evolution of the brain, we basically have three kinds of needs, safety, satisfaction, and connection. In effect, the brain uses three overarching systems to meet these needs. We avoid harms, we uh, approach rewards, and we attach to others. And to use a metaphor that's an easy way to remember this, uh, these needs are loosely related to the three stages of brain evolution. We need to uh, help the little inner lizard feel safe. We need to help the little inner mouse feel satisfied and fed. And we need to help the little inner monkey feel loved. So if you've heard me say this probably, in a way, we need to pet the lizard, you know, feed the mouse, and hug the monkey. Okay. And so here's the deal. If we have issues with safety, positive experiences in the approaching reward system are not going to be very helpful. For example, if you're, if you're feeling threatened, gratitude is nice, but it's not going to solve your anxiety. If you're feeling threatened, your boss praising you is nice, but it's not going to make you feel less anxious. Flip the other way, let's suppose you've recently been hurt in a relationship. Someone's mistreated you or been kind of cold or even, you know, dumped you in some way. So then if you're feeling like you have an issue in terms of your social needs with the attaching to other system, if you feel rewarded, like you get a promotion, that's nice, but I still feel lonely. I still feel abandoned. Or if you, you know, buy a lock for your front door, great, now I'm more protected, but I still feel um, inadequate and unloved and mistreated. We need resource experiences that are targeted to our issues. So I think there are four really powerful questions in a row. One, what's the issue? What's the problem that we're grappling with? Either a difficult situation, or maybe a long-standing issue in our own psychology, or maybe an issue in our personal practice, spiritual practice of some kind. Second question, what, if it were more present inside my mind, would really help? That's an incredibly useful question. Third, now that I know what that inner resource would be. In other words, if I'm feeling anxious, it would help to have more sense inside my mind of being protected, or relaxation, or inner strength. Or if I'm feeling frustrated or disappointed, or like there's a loss, well, it would help me to feel more grateful, or glad, or pleasured, or accomplished. Or if I'm feeling, in terms of the attaching system, if I'm feeling mistreated, or inadequate, or lonely, or unwanted, or devalued, left out, voted off the island, as it were, well then, it would serve me to have more experiences of being seen, wanted, included, prized, sought, uh, befriended, liked, appreciated, even loved. See? So then, yes, so you see the examples of answers to the second question? Then once we know what we're looking for, we get, these, we get the good stuff inside ourselves by having experiences of it. One, now that I know in my answer to the second question what it is I'm trying to grow inside myself, third question, how can I have experiences of this? How can I be a friend to myself and help myself have experiences of this? Either by highlighting uh, experiences of this strength that I'm already having, and instead of wasting them, take the extra 10, 20 seconds to help them sink in? Or how can I look for opportunities to have this particular experience that would serve me? When I realized in my late teens and early 20s that I really needed to have experiences of being included and liked, because that's where my personal wounding was, I really looked for opportunities to have those experiences. I looked for evidence that people, they weren't you know, million-dollar moments. These were not my best friends but they were moments where people were friendly or appreciative or including or warm or even liking. Gosh, you know? Uh, And when I saw them, I knew they were high-value experiences for me. Okay, that's the third question. How could I have more experiences of this inner resource that I need more of inside me? And fourth, once I'm having this experience, once it's activated, fourth, how could I install it in my brain? How can I help it sink in 10 or 20 seconds at a time? 
in the most important minute of my life, the next one. So that's the ordinary use. We can use, we can use taking in the good for everyday well-being and effectiveness and in targeted ways to bring in the key resources, the antidote experiences, the soul food that we really, really need. Then there's the, I don't know what to call it, I'll call it the extraordinary use of taking in the good. In the Buddhist model of our suffering, which is utterly psychological, you know, the Four Noble Truths, as you may know, there is a truth of suffering, which is an experience. Suffering is an experience ranging from subtle stress or discontent or unease or unsatisfactoriness of things all the way out to excruciating mental or physical anguish. Second, in the Buddha's model, a primary, if not the primary source of our suffering is in a single broad umbrella term, craving. Or in more conventional language, drivenness, pressure, resisting in terms of the avoiding system of the brain, grasping, chasing in terms of the approaching rewards system of the brain, or clinging, clutching in terms of the attaching to others system of the brain. That kind of drivenness leads to unease and disturbance, contraction, creates vicious negative cycles with other people. That's the Buddha's model. See for ourselves, right? Then in the third noble truth, there's the truth of the end of the cause of suffering, which is to say the end of the craving that leads to suffering and harm. And then in the fourth noble truth, we have the path, the eightfold path, that both embodies um, less suffering and greater happiness and is also a path to it. Okay. So here's the question. If in the Buddhist model, the cause of suffering is craving, what's the cause of craving? Why do we crave? From a psychological, biological perspective, grounded in evolution, we crave because of an underlying sense of deficit or disturbance. That's the source of craving. So the third noble truth is the truth of reducing craving, ending eventually craving. How do you actually do that with a biology that has evolved over you know, 600 million years in terms of the nervous system, grounded on nearly 3 billion years before that of life altogether? How do we help ourselves come to the end of craving? when we have an organism that survives through craving and suffering and craving. Survives through the, you know, being able to suffer, which generates craving, and then survives through craving that leads to more suffering while also passing on genes. This is where the extraordinary usage of taking in the good comes in. Because when we take in the good, in the moment of taking it in, in terms of our core needs for safety, satisfaction, and connection, in that moment we have an opportunity to experience that our core needs have been met. In this moment we are truly safe, or we can experience in this moment we are truly full. There is everything that we need here. Or in the moment we can experience we are truly connected, included, liked enough, loved enough, popular enough, valued enough, and in, this, in that moment, in this moment, it's possible through registering good experiences that in that moment at least, there's no true basis for craving. There's no deficit. Nothing is missing. There's no disturbance. And through repeatedly internalizing wholesome positive experiences, repeatedly registering the sense of no deficit and no disturbance, gradually we can weave into the fabric of our being an unconditional sense of needs met, of safety, of satisfaction and connection. So there's no actual basis for the craving that leads to suffering and harm. That's the extraordinary usage of taking the good. To gradually cultivate such a profound sense of all rightness and fullness and loved and lovingness that there's no natural basis for any craving or harm.
That's it for this episode. And if you enjoyed it, please consider subscribing to the podcast. I'd like to say also that if you like this material, I bet you'll really like my free weekly Just One Thing newsletter. It suggests a simple practice that will bring you more joy, more fulfilling relationships, and more peace of mind and heart with a new practice every week. If you'd like to sign up for the Just One Thing newsletter, I've included a link in the description. We'll be back later this week with another short episode on taking in the good. Until then, I'm Rick Hansen, and be well.